Uh, good evening. Uh, before I get started, uh, um, I wanted to say a, a few words about uh, the importance of having a uh, debate like this. Um, uh, just yesterday, I, I don't know if this, is a, if this is accurate, it was on Reuters that uh, an Egyptian court had sentenced uh, seven Egyptian Christians to death for having some role in the uh, recent Muhammad film. I don't think those Christians are, are going to be killed. I think they're not even in the country. Um, but it, it is a, a concern that uh, people are being sentenced to death for uh, having some role in a YouTube video that it was so horribly bad, uh, no one would have watched it if there hadn't been international riots over it. And this is modern, moderate, uh, post-Arab uh, Spring Egypt sentencing people to death for making a YouTube video. Um, in the past few decades, people have seen, the world has seen riots, deadly riots, over uh, a book, Salman Rushdie's Satanic Verses, over uh, cartoons, those that were published in a Danish newspaper, and of course now a, a YouTube video. And uh, the point I want to make here is that whether people know something about Islam or not, they're looking at this and saying, hey, what's, what's going on here? This is, this is a concern. And I don't know exactly how things are here in the UK. I assume that it's pretty similar to the United States. Um, but in the United States, if you start asking questions saying, hey, what's, what's, what's going on with Islam? Uh, you're immediately labeled some kind of racist, Islamophobic, hate-mongering uh, bigot. And that's a concern because if you look at uh, riots over cartoons or riots over a YouTube video. The goal in, in some of these countries is obviously to uh, silence criticism uh, of Muhammad, silence criticism of Islam. And we find sort of the same goal, although a different means to, this, to the same end, uh, in places like the United States and Europe, where you're not going to be arrested, you're probably not going to be killed uh, over criticizing Muhammad or criticizing Islam. Uh, but you'll certainly uh, face some consequences. You'll face ridicule, you'll face uh, charges of, of racism and bigotry and so on. And, you know, uh, I'm a Christian. I know what it's like to be uh, criticized. Uh, it would never cross my mind if someone says, hey, David, you've got all these problems with Christianity. Christianity is just silly and it's ridiculous. Uh, it would never occur to me to say, oh, what a bigoted hate monger. Now, obviously, there are in the world bigoted hate mongers. They, they, they exist. Uh, but just the fact that someone criticizes, criticizes my religion wouldn't put them in that category uh, for me. Uh, so there is uh, this, uh, this, this concern about uh, freedom of speech and Islam. Uh, probably my bi it's probably my biggest concern about Islam because once the freedom of speech goes, uh, everything else is sort, of, is sort of hopeless because now you can't even discuss the issues that would, uh, that would concern you. Uh, and, and, and the point of all of this is not to say something negative. The point is to say something positive. Uh, namely, I'm absolutely thrilled that we're having... Uh, a debate right now on a very sensitive topic. And uh, I, I have to say, uh, for the Muslim Debate Initiative, and especially Sami Zatri, we've had our differences on all kinds of issues uh, in the past, but at the end of the day, uh, I have all the respect in the world for Sami and for MDI for taking on some of the most difficult topics anyone could, could think of. And, you know, is Islam a threat to society? That is. Uh, probably one of the diffi most difficult topics I can, I can think of from, from a Muslim perspective. Uh, you know, standing here and responding to any kind of charges that someone might want to bring up, uh, that, that charging that Islam is a threat. And so, um, again, I have lots of respect uh, for this, and, uh, and uh, I, I hope to see debates like this in the future. Again, uh, probably the biggest concern of lots of people is the, is the, is the relationship between Islam and free speech. And so, uh, this is a good way. This is a good way to uh, in, inform people uh, and get people talking. And uh, and uh, as long as as long as free speech, as long as we still have freedom of speech on the table, I think we can. Uh, I think we can handle anything else. Uh, so, is Islam a threat to society? Obviously, I'm on the affirmative this evening, and I am convinced that Islam uh, threatens society in numerous ways. Uh, but I'm going to limit myself to two areas tonight, Islam as a threat to non-Muslims and Islam as a threat to women. And to keep things simple, I'll focus on three points in each of these areas. Uh, I could bring up lots of other points, but um, uh, I, I do want to make sure that, that we have time to, to fully address them, uh, these points this evening. 
So let's begin with three ways Islam poses a threat to non-Muslims. First, uh, Islam's attitude towards non-Muslims is a threat to society. Let's have a look at what the Quran says about uh, Muslims first. Chapter 3, verse 110 uh, of the Quran says to Muslims, you are the best of peoples ever raised up for mankind. So Muslims are the best people in the world, according to the Quran. What about Jews and Christians? Surah 98, verse 6 reads in the Hillelic Khan translation, Verily, those who disbelieve in the religion of Islam, the Quran, and Prophet Muhammad from the people of the scripture, that's Jews and Christians, and al-Mushrikun will abide in the fire of hell. They are the worst of creatures. So Christians and Jews and polytheists and pagans and so on, uh, I'm guessing atheists would be in the same category. Uh, we are the worst of creatures. Muslims are the best of people. So according to the Quran then, Muslims and non-Muslims are not equal. Muslims are the best. Jews and Christians are the worst. I'd say it's kind of hard to build a, a fair society when your God tells you that certain people are the worst of creatures. Keep in mind that's worse than pigs, worse than dogs, worst of creatures in general. And we can see the results of these kinds of teachings um, wherever there is significant, uh, wherever there's a significant non-Muslim population in a Muslim-majority uh, country. So think about Pakistan. Uh, not surprisingly, given the utter inferiority of Jews and Christians, uh, the Quran condemns friendship with us. As we read in Surah 551, O you who believe, do not take the Jews and the Christians for friends. They are friends of each other. We even know that Muhammad decided to get rid of all Jews and Christians um, in Arabia. In Sahih Muslim 4366, Muhammad said, I will expel the Jews and Christians from the Arabian Peninsula and will not leave any but Muslims. Now, if Muhammad himself couldn't imagine living alongside Jews and Christians in the Arabian Peninsula, I don't know how Muslims today can tell us that Islam uh, poses no threat to a harmonious society. Second, Islam commands Muslims to violently subjugate non-Muslims. And I would say this, this is certainly a threat to society. Um, if you want to understand jihad, you have to understand one simple, uh, one simple fact, and that's that jihad proceeds in stages. Uh, Muslims are commanded different things depending on where they are in the world. And the pattern we find in the life of Muhammad, the pattern we find in the Quran, the pattern we find in the Hadith, the pattern we find in the commentaries, it's all the same sort of three-step pattern. Three stages. Stage one, when Muslims are outnumbered, they are to proclaim a message of peace and tolerance. And uh, when Muhammad was a persecuted prophet in Mecca, when he had only a few dozen followers, uh, we read one of the most peaceful passages in the Quran. I love this passage. Surah 109, say, O unbelievers, I do not serve that which you serve, nor do you serve him whom I serve, nor am I going to serve that which you serve, nor are you going to serve him whom I serve. You shall have your religion, and I shall have my religion. That's what, we, that's what Muslims are commanded in Surah 109 to say to non-Muslims, you have your religion, I have my religion. What's the problem? That's when Muslims are a minority in society. That's just stage one. Stage two, when Muslim numbers increase, they are permitted to engage in defensive jihad. And there are uh, many passages in the Quran about defensive jihad. Uh, I'll read one. This is the first passage allowing Muslims to fight. For this, they were commanded not to fight, not even in self-defense. Uh, so, Surah uh, 22, 39 to 40, says, Permission to fight is given to those upon whom war is made because they are oppressed. And most surely, Allah is well able to assist them, those who have been expelled from their homes without a just cause, except that they say, our Lord is Allah. So, uh, defensive, you can fight to defend yourselves. And many people in the West wouldn't have uh, any objection to fighting in self-defense. People are, uh, you know, attacking your community or something like that. Uh, but lots of people want to pretend that that's the Quran's final word on dealing with uh, non-Muslims, and it's just not. It's not in the life of Muhammad, not in the Quran, not in the Hadith. One of the last two surahs revealed was Surah 9. And we find a very different message in Surah 9 of the Quran. I'll read Surah 929 because it specifically refers uh, to the people of the book, Jews and Christians. 
Surah 929, fight those who believe not in Allah. Notice what it says, fight those who believe not in Allah. Not fight people who are persecuting you and expelling you from your homes anymore. Fight those who do not believe in Allah, nor the last day, nor hold that forbidden which hath been forbidden by Allah and his messenger, nor acknowledge the religion of truth. From among the people of the book, that's Jews and Christians, until they pay the jizya with willing submission and feel themselves subdued. So, fight unbelievers, including Jews and Christians, until they pay the jizya and feel themselves subdued. Muhammad said in Sahih al-Bukhari 6924, I've been ordered to fight the people till they say, La ilaha illallah. And whoever said, La ilaha illallah, Allah will save his property and his life from me. Notice what he says. He does not say, I have been ordered to fight people until they stop attacking me. I have been ordered to fight people till they recite the Shahada. It's very different from the early, earlier stages of Islam. At first where there's no fighting, and uh, then when there's fighting and self-defense. Here it's fighting people specifically because of their unbeliefs. And I'd say that's certainly a threat to society. Third, Islam's command to kill apostates are a threat to society. Western nations generally support freedom of religion. If you uh, want to become a Muslim, you're free to do so. If you want to leave Islam, you're free to do that as well. Uh, so how do we reconcile freedom of religion with Muhammad's command to kill anyone who leaves Islam? Let me quote some ahadith. Sahih al-Bukhari, 6922. <coughs> Allah's messenger said, if anyone changed his Islamic religion, then kill him. I don't know of a, of a more clear command. If anyone leaves his Islamic religion, kill him. Sunan Ibn Majah, 2535. It was narrated from Ibn Abbas that the messenger of Allah said, whoever changes his religion, execute him. Malik Smuwata, 36, 18, 15, the Messenger of Allah said, if someone changes his religion, then strike off his head. So how are these commands not a threat to freedom of religion and therefore to Western society itself? Uh, according to Islam then, non-Muslims are inferior to non- uh, non-Muslims are inferior to Muslims and are to be treated accordingly. Muslims are commanded to violently subjugate non-Muslims when they have an opportunity and no longer form uh, a small minority. And uh, Muhammad commanded his followers to kill anyone who leaves Islam. Is this a threat to society? I would say, uh, obviously it is. But Islam also threatens society by drastically reducing the status of women. Uh, Muhammad said in Sunan Abu Dawood, number 2135, if I were to command anyone to make prostration, sort of prostration in your prayers, if I were to command anyone to make prostration before another, I would command women to prostrate themselves before their husbands because of the special right over them given to husbands by Allah. What's a good woman like according to Muhammad? Jamia Termidi, 964. When Allah's messenger was asked which woman was the best, he replied, the one who pleases her husband when he looks at her, obeys him when he gives a command, and does not go against his wishes regarding her person or property by doing anything of which he disapproves. The Quran even claims that women are the property of men. Allah tells Muslims in Surah 2, 223, your wives are as a tilth unto you, so approach your tilth when or how ye will. So they're your fields where you sow your seed. Approach them however you want. So let's consider three specific ways that Islam threatens women and therefore society as a whole. First, Islam's support for wife beating is a threat to society. Surah 434 is a, is a good place to start. The verse says, men are in charge of women. Why is that? Because Allah hath made the one of them to excel the other. So by nature, men excel women and because they spend of their property for the support of women. So good women are the obedient, guarding in secret that which Allah hath guarded. But what do you do if these women get out of line? As for those from whom ye fear rebellion, admonish them and banish them to beds apart and scourge them. Then if they obey you, seek not a way against them. 
There are lots of passages uh, we could bring up, we might bring up more uh, in the course of this debate. Uh, Sunan Abu Dawud 2142, Muhammad said, a man will not be asked why he beat his wife. So it's no one else's business if someone is beating his wife. Uh, there's one very disturbing passage from, from my perspective where uh, a woman is brought to Muhammad who had been beaten uh, by her husband. Now, just to be fair to the context, she was saying false things about her husband, but he, he beat her until she had some sort of uh, green, uh, green bruise, skin. Um, Aisha, looking at this, said, in Sahih al-Bukhari 5825, I have not seen any woman suffering as much as the believing women. This is not David Wood saying this. This is Aisha, the mother of the faithful, saying, I have not seen any woman suffering as much as the believing women. This is Aisha, this is one of Muhammad's wives, saying, the Muslim women had it worse than the pagan women. Second, Islam's claims about the stupidity of women are a threat to society. In Surah 2, 282, the Quran discusses contracts, and we find that the testimony of a woman is worth half the testimony of a man. The passage says, And get two witnesses out of your own men. And if there are not two men available, then a man and two women, such as, uh, uh, such as you agree for witnesses, so that if one of them, two women, errs, the other one can remind her. But why are uh, women less reliable as witnesses? Muhammad tells us in Sahih al-Bukhari 2658, the prophet said, isn't the witness of a woman equal to half of that of a man? The women said, yes. He said, this is because of the deficiency of her mind. So women are deficient in intellect, according to Muhammad. Let's look at one more passage. Sahih Muslim 142. Muhammad said, O oh, women folk, you should give charity and ask much forgiveness, for I saw you in bulk among the dwellers of hell. A wise lady among them said, Why is it, Messenger of Allah, that our folk are in bulk in hell? Upon this the Holy Prophet observed, You curse too much and are ungrateful to your spouses. I have seen none lacking in common sense and failing in religion, but at the same time robbing the wisdom of the wise besides you. Upon this the woman remarked, What is wrong with our common sense and with our religion? He, the Holy Prophet, observed, Your lack of common sense can be well judged from the fact that the evidence of two women is equal to one man. That is a proof of the lack of common sense. And people wonder why the Taliban are against young girls going to school. Third, Islam's support for marrying prepubescent girls is a threat to society. Muhammad married a girl named Aisha when she was either six or seven years old, depending on the source, and he consummated the marriage. He had sex with her when she was nine years old. Quote a few passages, there are uh, certainly plenty more. Sahih al-Bukhari 3895, Khadija died three years before the Prophet departed to al Medina. He stayed there for two years or so, and then he wrote the marriage contract with Aisha when she was a girl of six years of age, and he consummated that marriage when she was nine years old. Sahih Muslim 3311, Aisha reported that Allah's apostle married her when she was seven years old, and she was taken to his house as a bride when she was nine, and her dolls were with her. And when he, the Holy Prophet, died, she was 18 years old. Sunan Abu Dawud, number 2116, Aisha said, the apostle of Allah married me when I was seven years old, uh, the narrator Suleiman said, or six years old, he had intercourse with me when I was nine years old. And who is the greatest moral example according to the Quran? That would be Muhammad, according to Surah 3321. He is the pattern of conduct. Doesn't mean you have to do that. Muhammad had uh, various numbers of uh, different wives and so on. Uh, certainly, uh, certainly allows it. Uh, so, we find certain teachings about violence, we find certain teachings about women, and it's a very common attitude, uh, especially in the West, that you know, it, it kind of doesn't matter what Islam teaches or what, or what Christianity teaches or what any other religion teaches, because most people don't take these sorts of things that seriously, and so you know, they're not going to have much of an impact on society. So, let me, um, let me quote some statistics by various polling agencies that have taken place uh, over the past several years. 15% uh, 
of American Muslims, so it's not worldwide Muslims, 15% of American Muslims under age 30 believe that suicide attacks in defense of Islam are at least sometimes justified. Not always, but sometimes. You say 15%, well, that's not much. That's a minority. Well, it's 15% of uh, several million Muslims in the United States under age, well, I guess less, under age 30. One-third of British Muslim students believe that killing in the name of Islam is sometimes justified, not always, but in certain situations, yes. 40% of British Muslim students want the UK to adopt Sharia. One-fourth of British Muslims say that the 7-7 attacks were justified. A quarter. A quarter. 68% of British Muslims support the arrest and prosecution of anyone who insults Islam. You could, since there's no clear criteria of what exactly constitutes that, you could say I am right now by, by criticizing some of Muhammad's claims. 62% of Canadian Muslims want some form of Sharia in Canada. 59% of Indonesian Muslims supported Osama bin Laden when the poll was taken in 2003. 59% supported bin Laden. 44% of Pakistanis viewed Osama bin Laden as a martyr for Islam. 49% of Nigerian Muslims have a favorable view of Al-Qaeda. It's around half. 31% of Muslims in Turkey say that suicide attacks against the West are justified. Not just, not just any attack, suicide attacks. About a third of Muslims in Turkey, moderate Turkey. 78% of Pakistanis support killing apostates. 78%. 78%. That's a vast majority. 32% of Palestinians support, supported the massacre of the Fogel family. Now, there are different views of, uh, of the you know, Israeli-Palestinian conflict, but as far as going in and deliberately killing children, uh, about a third of Palestinian Muslims support the actual act of going and targeting uh, even children. One-fourth of Turkish Muslims support honor killings, and one in 10 Young British Muslims support honor killings in some situations. So those are various things about violence. Uh, let me uh, give a quick statistic on uh, gender equality and social institutions in a report from the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. They um, examined various countries around the world and rated them based on certain criteria, equal opportunities for education or employment for women, laws to protect women from physical violence, equal rights under the law regarding ownership of property, guardianship right to their own children, son preference, so if culture prefers sons to daughters, it gets a, a lower score, equal access to divorce rights, and the percentage of women married or divorced by age 16. So they rated these countries on how well they did uh, on these various women's rights issues. Let me give you the bottom 12 countries, the 12 worst places in the world to live if you're a woman. Um, worst place in the world to live if you're a woman. Sudan, happens to be a Muslim majority country. Next, Afghanistan, Muslim majority country. Sierra Leone, Muslim majority country. Mali, Muslim majority country. Yemen, Muslim majority country. Chad, Muslim majority country. India, not a Muslim majority country, but it's, on the, it's, a, it's among the bottom 12. Islamic Republic of Iran, Muslim-majority country. Pakistan, Muslim-majority country. Iraq, Muslim-majority country. Yeah, thanks. Pakistan, Iraq, United Arab Emirates, and Libya, all Muslim-majority countries round out the bottom. Uh, so, where does that come from? Why is the correlation? Things can be related in various ways, uh, but when we look at Muhammad's teachings and then look at the outcome of those teachings, the correlation <coughs> is pretty straightforward. Uh, so we've seen, um, as far as non-Muslims, Islam uh, views non-Muslims as inferior. Islam commands Muslims to violently subjugate non-Muslims, and Muhammad commanded his followers to kill apostates. As far as women, Islam uh, at least allows, we wouldn't say you have to beat your wife as a, as a Muslim, but it allows it. Uh, Islam declares that women are intellectually deficient, and Islam at least allows uh, sex with prepubescent girls. I would view all of these uh, as a problem, I just want to clarify here as I, as I close out that when I say Islam teaches these things, I'm not saying any of you, any of the Muslims in here, do this. 
there can be a massive difference between what Christianity teaches and what a Christian does. There can be a massive difference between what Islam teaches and what a Muslim does. Um, but right now we're talking about whether Islam, Islam, the teachings of uh, Muhammad and the Quran and the Hadith, um, are a threat to society. And I say, based on what we've seen, the answer is obviously yes. All right. Uh, is the sound all right for everybody? All right. First of all, I'd like to uh, thank the uh, Fosses South and the Portsmouth ISOC for helping hosting this evening's debate. And I'd also like to thank uh, David Wood for joining me again. We've debated several times. And I asked uh, for this debate. Is it on? Yeah, is it on? No. They can hear me. Clip it here and then you, that's the mic too. Uh, I'll just hold it. Is the sound all right for everybody? Yes. Yeah, no, okay. Sorry. So, as I was saying, I, I was the one who asked for tonight's debate because I wanted to debate this issue because I like debating contentious, relevant issues rather than hiding away from them. And as the topic says, is Islam a threat to modern society? Now, I'd say. Uh, the most relevant part of David Wood's speech really came at the end. For, he quoted a lot of verses and a lot of hadiths, but as we all know, there's different ways of interpreting texts, and many Muslims don't view the text as he views them. You know, as he said, he said a very important point at the end. A Christian might do something that the Bible doesn't command, but that's a bit convenient to say that when it comes to my faith and someone does something bad, it's not because our book says so. But when it comes to the other faith, that it's because their, their texts are just all barbaric and Muslims see it that way. And so we don't need to get into an interpretive war of what this text or that text means. But we can get into that maybe in the rebuttal period and I can address some of those points. And the reason I say that, as I said, at the end, Wood started making relevant points because he started talking about polls. Because in this debate, I want to actually debate the actual ground reality of what's going on rather than theological interpretations of verses because we can debate theology all day long but then there's something happening in the real world for example uh, Wood brought up the issue of jihad and indeed one of the main reasons why people say Islam is a threat to modern society and David was making that point is because of the issue of jihad you know terrorism we have a lot of uh, Islamic extremism today. And so the argument is Islamic extremists are a result of Islam. The reason you have people flying planes into buildings is because of Islam. You know, they looked at those teachings that Wood brought up and they say, now we're going to go kill the non believers because uh, Surah 929 tells us to kill them or because the Prophet commanded us to fight them. Now if we want to understand terrorism, then we need to do a proper investigation of why those Islamic extremists are doing what they're doing, then we can jump to conclusions. And I must say, I'm a bit qualified to talk about that because I wrote my dissertation on Osama bin Laden's network and why they're fighting. And it was, it was a successful dissertation. So let's analyze the motivations of those terrorists before you want to just blame Islam. And here's a point we have to make. Just because we talk about their motivations does not mean we agree with them. So there's a big difference. Someone might have a legitimate beef or a, leg a legitimate political uh, issue, but it doesn't mean we agree with their methodology on how they do things. But there might be a legitimate concern. Now, according to Wood, and many of his colleagues, they say, as I said, the reason bin Laden exists is because of Islam. Well, is that the case? In 1996, bin Laden actually released his manifesto, a declaration of war against the United States. Now, you'd think, if you want to analyze why he's doing what he's doing, him and his men, then you'd start off by reading that text. And if you read that text, according to bin Laden, he doesn't say we're fighting you because of freedom or we're fighting you because uh, we're just Muslims and we feel like having a fight with you because you're not Muslims. No, he clearly says that they're fighting back because of the aggression against them. 
for example, American troops in the Arabian Peninsula, what's happening in Palestine, what's happening in <coughs> Iraq. He said the same thing in 1997 in an interview with Atwan Barry, who lives in London, who owns his own newspaper. And in 2004, there's so many statements I can give you, but in 2004, a video was released by bin Laden, and he said the reason for 9-11. You know, people often ask, oh, why do they hate us? Well, the man who did it, in this video, told you why he did it, but for some reason, people just ignored him. So, why did bin Laden say Al-Qaeda did 9-11? Was it because, um, yeah, we just hated freedom, you know, we don't like baseball games? Or was it because uh, the Qur'an simply said so, you know, we're Muslims and you're the worst of creatures, that's why we're going to fly planes into buildings. No, he said none of that. Instead, he gave legitimate reasons. Now, legitimate reasons doesn't equal legitimacy to go and do what you do. There's a big difference between the two. But he gave legitimate political grievances. Number one, the issue in Palestine, the illegitimate occupation that's happening. Number two, the sanctions in Iraq, which killed over a half a million children, some say 100,000, whichever, it's bad enough. And then he brought up as well the war in Lebanon in 1982, how Israel went in and it completely destroyed the infrastructure of Lebanon, killed thousands of innocent civilians. And if you visited Lebanon in the 90s, like I did, you'd see all the destruction everywhere in civilian populations. And so these were the reasons he gave for his attacks. Specific, fo specific foreign political issues. You know, dead babies in Iraq, the issue in Palestine, and the issue in Lebanon, all of these things put together. And the presence of American troops in the Muslim world, and so forth and so forth. And the new leader, Ayman al-Zawahiri, says the same things. You know, other leaders, such as uh, al-Libi, who's been killed, they all say the same things. None of them ever come up and say, we're fighting you because we hate your freedom and because we think you're the worst of creatures and because we're Muslims, you're not, and uh, we just hate you because, you know, whatever. You like watching Sports Center or what have you. Those are not the reasons as to why they fight. So what do the academics say as well? You know, let's, let's strengthen the argument. We know what they say. We know what the, the actual extremists themselves say. So now let's go to the academics. So, for, for example, a recent study was made. David was quoting so many studies, so now let's quote our own studies. A study by the National Bureau of Economic Research. They recently did their own study, which found that civilian casualties in Afghanistan at the hands of foreign troops creates enemies and causes people to become radicalized and to join the insurgency. That is their words. This is a Western organization saying that foreign, uh, foreign casualties, casualties at the hands of foreigners in Afghanistan, foreign troops, causes people to become radicalized. It's not because they picked up the Quran and just said, yeah, today I feel like becoming a radical. What a surprise. Another study about drone strikes in Yemen found out the same thing. An in-depth report was done by the Washington Post, and they quoted human rights organizations, they quoted uh, people in Yemen, and what did they find? According to their studies, drone strikes in Yemen caused an increase in support for Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula. In fact, there was a correlation. The more drone strikes happened, the more popular Al-Qaeda was becoming, and the more bigger they were becoming. So you can even see the direct correlation for yourself. And again, another surprise. What about drone strikes in Pakistan? A recent study was done by Stanford University and New York University. According to their own studies, people in the Pakistani tribal areas, civilians, are being terrorized. They're being terrorized by drone strikes. But in this case, it's good terrorism, right? Because when we, the West, do it, well, that's not really terrorism. Or there's justified reasons when we uh, go and kill some innocent child and blow their limbs into pieces. You know, a lot of people were talking about uh, Malala, the schoolgirl who got shot, and we condemn that. But what about all the Malalas who've been killed by drone strikes? Where's their uh, condemnations? You know, where's their pictures? 
why aren't they being put up there to be uh, Time Magazine's most influential person? Oh yeah, they're, they're uh, collateral damage, it doesn't matter. And if you want to read all these reports, then take their website. It's, it's a very good website. You can see the interviews with the victims and the families. It's uh, livingunderdrones.org. Again, this is a Western university saying that this is causing terrorism. And when you terrorize people and you kill innocent civilians, do you think those people are going to come uh, offering you cookies? Or are they going to come offering you a fight? We know the answer. And here's the best study of all. And this practically it refutes most of what he said. And this, this, is the, this is the smoking gun. Always keep this fact in the whole debate. A major study was done by the Arizona State University's Center of Strategic Communications. So what they did is they examined over 2,000 texts from Islamic extremists from 1998 to 2011. And that's a lot of uh, text to read and to examine. And what was their conclusion? They examined all the Quranic verses that were being quoted by these extremists. And they were examining the context in which the verses were quoted. For example, David Wood brings up Surah 929. You see, because of that verse, Muslims are going out to conquer the world. Well, guess what? According to this study, the reason why Islamic extremists quote Quranic verses is not for world domination. The context that they use the Quran in is in defensive ways, responding to aggression, victimization, dishonor, and retribution, their own words. So when they quote the Quran, they're not doing it the way David tells you that, yeah, we just want to go conquer you. They're doing it as a defensive response. And here's the irony. They barely ever quote Surah 929, and they barely ever quote Surah 9, verse 5, verses David Wood always loves to bring up. They always quote Surah 929, but the extremists themselves barely quote that verse. That shows you not a lot of research is being done. But now, let's say you want to reject the academics. Well, let's do something better. How about I quote you the intelligent officers, the people who are fighting these people. Let's see what they have to say. And here's a good thing. I personally know, I personally know a counter-terrorism expert. I personally know somebody who infiltrated a terrorist cell in Canada and foiled the terrorist plot, Mubin Sheikh. You can Google him. And so I interviewed this person. You know, this guy is the real deal. He infiltrates a group, and he's a counter-terrorism officer, counter officer. What does he have to say? I asked him bluntly, I just asked him in an interview, do these extremists hate us and attack us because they just hate our freedom and because they're just a bunch of mad Islamic extremists? And his answer, what was it? It should be yes, if everything David is saying is right, but according to him, that's a lot of nonsense. The bigger irony is that I even named David Wood. I asked them people like David Wood, Robert Spencer, use these arguments. What do you have to say about that? And this counter-terrorism expert said that that's just not true. If Mubin Sheikh's not good enough for you, I'll bring someone better. Michael Scheuer. Does anyone know who he is? This guy spent 22 years in the CIA. Not only did he spend 22 years in the CIA, he was the head of the unit that was tracking bin Laden from 1996 to 1999 and from 2001 to 2004 he was a special advisor to the new chief guy, to the new two top guy. So what does he say? This guy should know better than all of us. He's with the CIA, he's an American patriot, so what does he have to say? Do these extremists hate us because uh, they hate our freedom? Is it because they're just a bunch of uh, lunatics? Well, according to him, they are at war, the Islamists, are at war because of foreign policy issues, not because of everything David is trying to tell you. And he named some of them. American support for Israel's occupation, America's wars and support and occupation in Afghanistan and Iraq, the uh, presence of American troops in the Arabian Peninsula, 
he names these as reasons. And you want a bigger irony? Bin Laden himself quoted this guy. He told Western people, if you want to know what we're about, go read this guy's books. I suggest you do the same. He has a book called Imperial uh, Hubris. So this man is a CIA agent. If he's not good enough for you, then nothing will. But let's even bring something better. The 9-11 Commission report, the investigation of 9-11, they talked about the motivations of those terrorists. So what did they come to? What did they conclude to? You can even find the video on YouTube. They basically asked the top intelligence guy to sum up the view. And he was an FBI agent, James Fitzgerald. He was basically the spokesperson. And these are ex his exact words, the reason why they did what they did. They identify with the Palestinian problem. They identify with people who oppose repressive regimes. And I believe they tend to focus their anger on the U.S. Hardly a surprise because the U.S. has its hands in all of those things. Now, if that's not good enough for you, then this is going to be the cake. In 2006, a report came out of every single intelligence agency in America. All of them together came together. You know, they wanted to release a report on terrorism and extremism. So all of them came together, and what conclusion did they arrive to? Did they say, yeah, the reason why terrorism is such a problem is because, you know what, Islam. You know, Islam has all of these verses, and why? What are we going to do with Islam? You know, we have so many problems. Surah 929, the Prophet told Muslims to just fight the unbelievers, and yeah, this is a big problem. They said none of that. Instead, their assessment and final conclusion was that the war in Iraq helped fuel, it helped fuel the spread of terrorism around the world. Every intelligence agency in America said that. And I brought this up a few years ago on one channel David Wood appears on, ABN. And I brought it up to a man named Walid Shabbat. And when I brought this up to him, he said, these guys are just a bunch of liberals. That's the response you get when you bring these arguments. So that's the terrorism issue out of the way. Keep every point I made in mind in the rest of the debate. Because you can quote a verse and say this verse means that, that's why they're terrorism. I just gave you a summarized reason as to why the extremism exists. Heck, I didn't give it to you. The intelligence officers gave it to you. Now, David talked about polls. And now, this is going to be the best, actually. There's always better stuff coming up. Now, he's going to have to be consistent. Because if he wants to say Islam is a threat, and let me just say something, I agree with Wood. There are threats from the Muslims. But where I disagree with Wood is saying that Islam is the cause of the threat. You see, I'd be on the same page as David if he was saying, yeah, we got a problem with Muslims and we got to sort it out, like honor killings. I'd 100% agree with Wood. We need to get together and try to stop that. But the problem is, he puts the blame on someplace else. Oh, it's it's because of Islam. Forget about all the Hindus and non-Muslim Africans doing honor killings. Forget about passion killings that take place in the West and South America. Yeah, yeah, just forget about all of that. You see, I can't do that. But nonetheless, on polls, now this is where we need to be consistent, because according to Wood, Islam is a threat because of all the polls he mentioned. Well, they did a poll in America last year, in America alone. They did a poll with Christians, Jews, Muslims, Mormons, and atheists. And they asked them, they asked each group, uh, which group was more likely. So they came up to you, say you're a Muslim, and they asked you, is it justified for the military to kill civilians, to target and kill civilians, not collateral damage? So that was the question. 21% 20 of Muslims said it's justified. What about the rest? 58% of Protestants and Catholics said it's justified for the military to kill innocent people. 64% of Jews said it's justified. 43% of atheists and agnostics said it's justified. In opposition, Muslims were the highest number of people opposed to killing innocent civilians by the military. What about the non-military? They asked them another question. 
what if it's a small group of people or an individual who kills a bunch of civilians? Is that justified? 11% of Muslims said it's justified. 26% of Protestants said it's justified. 27% of Catholics said it's justified. 22% of Jews said it's justified. And 23% of atheists said it's justified. So according to this poll, Christians, Jews, and atheists are far more likely to support the murder of innocent civilians. Now, if he's consistent, he's going to have to say, well, Christianity is a threat. Judaism is, is a threat. But now comes the convenient inconsistency. When there are bad Christians, it's because they're bad Christians. It has nothing to do with the Bible, even though the Bible has verses saying, go kill women and children, but it has nothing to do with the Bible. But when it comes to Muslims, oh, it's all because of the Quran. I'm sorry, ladies and gentlemen, but that's, that's completely inconsistent. And no non-biased person can take such an argument seriously. That argument is basically trying to have your cake and eat it. It just doesn't work. But now as for the polls on Muslims, let's address the polls on Muslims. But keep the other polls in mind because we want to be consistent. Yes, there are Muslims who say they'd like to have Sharia law in Britain. They ask British Muslims. Now, we need context. When British Muslims say they want Sharia law, what context do they mean? Do they mean that they want to take over your lives and make all of you Muslims? That's not what they mean. What they mean, they want Sharia law in their own personal lives in civil issues, like marriage. They'd like to have that marriage done under Sharia, or divorce, something like that. And the Jewish communities in Britain and Europe have the same thing. They have their own uh, Jewish court systems where they can go and do civil matter issues under Jewish law. So that's what Muslims mean when they say we want Sharia. Secondly, someone who says, I'd like to have Sharia in the West, is far different than saying, I'm going to impose Sharia in the West. If you were to ask a Christian or a secularist or a secular humanist, would you like the entire world to be secular humanist? They'd say yes. But that's a far different thing than saying, now I'm going to force everybody to become a secular humanist. And what about the polls about Muslims who uh, they, they, want, they support suicide bombing, or they think it's okay to kill, and so forth? Once again, context has to be shown to those polls. When you ask a Muslim about suicide bombing, he's not thinking about a suicide bombing that goes into a civilian population and just kills innocent people for the sake of killing them. He looks at that as, as the foreign political issue which I mentioned at the start. This is the problem with a lot of people. They don't view things through the Muslim perspective. They just view things, view things through their own perspective. When a Muslim answers questions like that, he's viewing things from the perspective of seeing places like Iraq getting bombed, <coughs> Afghanistan getting bombed, Palestine getting bombed, and so he's viewing it in that specific context. Context is always important to such polls. But nonetheless, if we're going by polls, if David wants to blame Islam for those polls, then he needs to blame Christianity for the polls I mentioned. And last but not least, the issue of freedom of speech, because David brought it up in his opening. And that is a relevant issue, because we do have uh, some issues of freedom of speech. But now we need to be consistent again. Trying to regulate freedom of speech isn't anything new. So when people point their fingers to Muslims and say, look, look at these Muslims, they're trying to ban freedom of speech, let's blame Islam. That's, that doesn't make sense, because regulation of free speech already exists. For example, in most of Europe, it's a crime to deny the Holocaust. You can get arrested for standing up on stage and saying, I don't think the Holocaust happened. I don't agree with it, but if someone, some scholar or some pseudo-academic wants to argue that, he'd be arrested and sent to jail for that. So freedom of speech is already regulated. In all of Europe, we have something called hate speech laws. So what is hate speech laws? Hate speech laws is the right to imprison or fine anybody who, who attacks another group of people because of their race, gender, or creed. 
And then we have something called defamation laws. Defamation laws are the very basis of prosecuting someone for offensive speech. Oh, you, sp you spread slander against me, so I'm going to sue you. That's regulating free speech. So freedom of speech is already regulated in Western society. So to act like it's something new with Muslims is false. Now as for Muslims who want to limit uh, the criticism of Islam, Muslims, I don't know any Muslims who say that they want to silence fair critique of Islam. I'd, I'd even ask all Muslims here, do you have a problem with someone arguing against Islam in a civilized and mannered way? Do you have a problem with that? No. Muslims don't have a problem with that. What Muslims are trying to silence or ban, which I don't support by the way, because I can take it and I can give it back, but nonetheless, what most Muslims have a problem with, such as the Organization of Islamic Cooperation States, the OIC, they want to ban hate speech that defames Muslims and, that, and brings negative consequences to Muslim society, such as comparing Muslims to Nazism or comparing Muslims to a secret enemy within who wants to take over. That is hate speech. You know, that's not civilized speech that's critiquing a religion. We saw that same speech used decades ago on another group. In fact, the irony, when the OIC say they want to prosecute Islamophobia, they use the laws I just brought up. Hate speech laws, uh, defamation laws, it's a crime to deny the Holocaust. They say, you already do that, so why don't you do that with us? So they're not trying to invent anything new. So freedom of speech is all good. Like, let's debate in a civilized way. Most Muslims don't have a problem with that. And I'll even challenge you, bring up any major Muslim group who said we want to ban civilized discourse between Christians and Muslims. We just want to ban a nice debate. I don't think that exists, but anyway, my time is up. All right, well, uh, thank you, Sammy, and uh, I appreciate a lot of the information you shared. Um, uh, a lot of the a lot of the information based on your uh, your personal studies was uh, was uh, was was new. Um, just to review what I argued in my opening statement, um, I argued that Islam poses a threat to society uh, in two major categories: one, non-Muslims, and two, uh, women. As far as my arguments that Islam poses a threat to non-Muslims, I said that Islam's attitude towards non-Muslims, namely that uh, Muslims are superior to non-Muslims, is uh, a threat to society, as is Islam's command to violently subjugate non-Muslims and Muhammad's command to kill apostates. As far as women, uh, I argued that Islam supports uh, wife-beating. This is certainly uh, a threat to society. Islam declares that women are intellectually <coughs> deficient, and Islam promotes marrying uh, prepubescent girls. These are all threats in various ways to society. Uh, Sammy didn't answer uh, much of that, so uh, I'm assuming he'll get to that in the rebuttals. He did say he's, uh, he, he doesn't want to get into an interpretive battle over uh, the Muslim scriptures, but uh, if these scriptures say what I'm saying that they say, then obviously they're a threat to society. If, if, if the Quran commands Muslims to subjugate non-Muslims, obviously that is a threat to society. So I hope he'll deal with some of the texts I presented. Um, Sammy spent a lot of time pointing out that Muslims who act in the world or Muslims who engage in terrorism, for, for instance, Al-Qaeda, they don't act from the motivations that I presented. So when Al-Qaeda views what they're doing, it's not uh, we want to subjugate the non-Muslims because they're the worst of creatures. It's because they're interfering in Muslim lands. And actually, I happen to agree with most of what Sammy said uh, in his presentation on this context. And, and we're actually going to come uh, to some agreement here. Uh, Sammy said that Osama bin Laden uh, was fighting against the West because of Western interference in Muslim lands, and he said uh, that, that most Muslims who, who quote the Quran in the context of groups like Al-Qaeda and so on, uh, quote the Quran for defensive texts, not for, for offensive texts about going out and subjugating the entire world. And I agree. I agree completely. Let's review the, the, the three stages of jihad 
And uh, you, can, you can read, you can read about these even in, in, certain, uh, in certain Muslim sources. If we want to go through sources, we can, uh, we can do that. Um, but it was a challenge so far. Uh, what I said was that Islam, uh, in, in Islam, jihad proceeds in stages. When Muslims form a small minority of the population, as Muhammad did in Mecca, they are to promote a message of peace and tolerance, as Muhammad did when he was in Mecca, and as the Quran verses revealed during this time uh, specify. Later, when Muslims have more, have a, a higher number, have a higher number, and can start defending themselves against uh, attacks or criticism, they are encouraged to engage in defensive jihad, fighting people who are posing some sort of uh, physical or intellectual threat to Islam. And it's only later, when Muslims form a majority, um, or when Muslims can actually go out and dominate other groups that they are encouraged to engage in offensive jihad. And notice that we find this pattern in the world. If you are a, a Christian in uh, many Muslim countries, uh, you're not going to have, most of the time, the same rights uh, as non-Muslims. If you look at Western countries, what is Islam all about? It's all about peace and tolerance. If you look at countries where it's kind of 50-50 or something like that, uh, you'll see it's not a safe place to criticize Islam. So we actually see the same pattern in the world today that we find in the Muslim sources and in the life of Muhammad. Now, as Sammy, Sammy's point was that most Muslims don't view themselves in the offensive jihad stage, not even, not even the terrorist groups. They're not going out and subjugating. But guess what? According to Islam, they're not supposed to. These groups are not capable of going and uh, conquering the United States and bringing it under Islamic rule. So according to Islam, they're not in stage three. They're not in the position where they can actually go out and dominate all the unbelievers. What stage are they in? Oh, not according to me, according to Islam. They're still in the defensive stage where they can defend themselves against aggression by other groups. And so when Sammy says that that's what they're doing, I would say that's exactly what they're supposed to be doing, according to Islam. And let me quote a, a couple of passages, and, and uh, if anyone doesn't understand uh, the mindset behind, say, the 7-7 bombings or 9-11, or it's actually pretty straightforward according to groups like Al-Qaeda. Let me read a verse from the Quran. Surah 5, verse 33. The recompense of those who wage war against Allah and his messenger and do mischief in the land is only that they shall be killed or crucified or their hands and their feet be cut off on opposite sides or be exiled from the land. That is their disgrace in this world, and a great torment is theirs in the hereafter. What's the punishment for making mischief in a Muslim land? It's death, or depending on the severity, imprisonment, or something like that, or exile. Uh, so, the penalty for making mischief in a Muslim land is death in an extreme case. Well, there is no more extreme form of making mischief in a Muslim land than having a non-Muslim military presence in the Muslim land or occupy, from a Muslim perspective, occupying an entire country, as with Israel. Many Muslims would, would view it that way. So Muslims regard uh, the United States involvement in Iraq or Afghanistan or United States support for Israel as making mischief in a Muslim land. And what would be the penalty, according to Islam? The penalty, as we just saw in Surah 5, verse 33, is death. Now, that would apply to people who actually are going out and making the mischief. Uh, but there, there, there's something interesting if you, if you study groups like Al-Qaeda and the writings they put out, they say that the average person in the population might actually be, uh, be responsible as well. And why? They're basing it on Muhammad's teachings. Let me quote you two ahadith from Muhammad. Sunan Ibn Majah, 2759. The Messenger of Allah said, Whoever equips a warrior in the cause of Allah, he will have a reward like his. Whoever equips the warrior has a reward equal to the warrior. Sahih al-Bukhari, 2843. Allah's Messenger said, He who prepares a Ghazi, Ghazi is a, a jihad fighter, going in Allah's cause is given a reward equal to that of a Ghazi. Notice what he says here. It's not just the person going out doing the fighting who gets the reward for the fighting. The person who funds that fighter who funds that soldier gets an equal reward. Why? Because the, the soldier wouldn't be able to go out and fight if it wasn't for, for the person who's funding the soldier. Makes perfect sense. What does that mean, though? If the United States is at war in Iraq or Afghanistan or, or doing something else in some other Muslim country and the penalty is death, that's the penalty on the soldiers, who's funding those soldiers so that they can actually carry on this uh, mischief-making in Muslim lands. 
Well, that would be people like me, people who pay taxes and fund the military. That's the mindset. You don't have to agree with it. Most of you probably don't agree with it. But if you look at the pattern, people making mischief in Muslim lands, that's the penalty. The penalty for that is death, Surah 533. And those who uh, support them financially, who make it possible for them to go out and fight, they are equally responsible. That's why you can have planes crashing into buildings. Because none of those people in the Twin Towers are innocent. They're not innocent. They're all paying, they're all funding the government, which is making mischief in Muslim lands. Makes perfect sense. Again, you don't have to agree with it, but that's uh, that's the idea. So I agree completely with Sammy that these groups view themselves as, in, as engaging in defensive, uh, defensive fighting, not offensive fighting. People are attacking Islam in various ways, and therefore Muslims are simply uh, defending themselves. Sammy says that uh, Muslims are at war due to foreign policy issues. So just to clarify, I've agreed with a lot of what he says, uh, but I'm going to have some uh, disagreements here. Sammy says that uh, Muslims are at war due to foreign policy issues. Well, if you think about uh, the Muslim reaction in various cases to these foreign policy issues, what foreign policy issues do Muslims face that no one else faces? Because the United States, I mean, let's face it, puts its nose in people's business all around the world. Most of those groups don't fly planes into buildings. Why is it somehow different? Well, you've seen, you can see, uh, you can see what, what, the, what the passages say in Surah 533 and in the Hadith. Uh, Sammy says that the war in Iraq actually fueled terrorism. I agree completely. It's supposed to, according to Islam. Interference in Muslim lands is supposed to provoke a reaction according to the Muslim sources. So that's exact. I agree completely. People in, he says that people in the West are complaining about the shooting of Malala. What about all the Malalas killed uh, in drone strikes? Well. Drone strikes usually aren't targeting uh, little girls, whereas the Taliban did. They shot her in the head for criticizing the Taliban. I'm not saying anyone supports that. I'm not saying uh, that that's not the point. I'm just saying there, there, is a, there is a massive difference there. But as far as if anyone else goes and targets a little girl, I don't care if it's uh, a Muslim, a Jew, uh, Israeli, Palestine, Christian, whatever, I would condemn any targeting of a, a little girl in a, in a, in a shooting. Um, he says that statistics show that Muslims in America are less likely to support the killing of innocent people um, than other groups, and that Christians and Jews and atheists are more likely to support killing innocents. I haven't read this study. I'll, I'll go ahead and grant it. Um, but Sammy says that I'm inconsistent, right? Because uh, let's suppose, let's, let's suppose all Christians support uh, going around killing innocent people or something like that. I suppose it was 100%. Why don't I then condemn Christianity? It seems that Sam, Sammy has represented my argument as, look, uh, you have various Muslims who are supporting terrorism, various Muslims supporting suicide attacks, various Muslims supporting honor killings, and I'm saying it's all Islam's fault. That was not my argument at all. My argument was, look, here are the sources, here are the sources which call for certain treatment towards non-Muslims, and here are sources calling for certain treatment of women, and then we see how these teachings have played out in the world, and people are obviously taking some of these teachings seriously. Just to clarify, if, 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 whether it's Christians, whether it's Muslims, right? A Christian, as I said earlier, a Christian can do something that totally contradicts Islam. A Muslim can do something that totally contradicts Islam. If a Muslim is out doing something that doesn't come from his sources, that isn't based on the teachings of Islam, I would not condemn Islam for it. At, at most, I would condemn the Muslim for it and say, hey, you're not, following your, you're not following the teachings of your religion. I would apply the exact same standard consistently to Christians, Jews, whoever. But when a Muslim is following the teachings of his religion, then I have to say it's Islam. It's Islam that is posing a threat here. Uh, so, well, I'm, I'm out of time, so uh, I'm certain that Sammy has uh, some responses. I hope he'll get to uh, some of the points I brought up in my opening statement, and uh, I'll be looking forward to responding. All right. Uh, lots of points to respond to. Now, David, basically, it's good he ended on what he said, because he started on that point, that he brought up issues from Islam, which he views, or teachings that he views as a source, that cause or can cause problems to non-Muslims, you know, Islam's attitude to non-Muslims. But what did I say in my presentation? Because I addressed that. That's his way of reading into it. You know, David Wood looks at a verse that he thinks has a bad attitude to non-Muslims, and so he'll read it and say, you see, that's the problem. But what I'm saying is that's your reading. 
And the argument can be used against you as well. Like the poll I brought up about Christians, that they, I could make the same argument. Now you say they're not being good Christians, but I can just turn around and say, well, there's a verse in the Bible that says that, so I see it that way, and they're bad because of that verse. So that's very subjective. So that point remains. According to you, there are these sources in Islam that uh, can cause problems, but I'm saying that's the way you read it. For example, the issue of you can't be friends with non-believers. Well, if you actually read it properly, it doesn't say friends. The word is actually allies or protectors. So there, right there is a big difference of how we're going to read it and how many other Muslims are going to read it. Secondly, there's another verse in the Quran, in the 60th chapter, that says that if someone's not oppressing you, there's no reason why you can't be good and kindly to them, which we'd even say friendly. So it's all about how you look at things and analyze them. And so what I'm basically trying to say is that you're looking at things from your own perspective. So rather than go into this circle of interpretive wars, let's look at the ground reality. So you brought up the issue of jihad. And I explained how those terrorists don't look at jihad the way you do. And you agreed with me. You said, yeah, they're, they're defending themselves. But then you go on to say, but that's only for now, because then they're going to, uh, there's three stages of jihad. Well, that's all theory. Where, where did they actually say that? You know, we have what they say. The studies say that there is no plan for a conquest. Not now, not in the future. So once again, that's not really an argument. That's an interpretive issue. Let's stick with what's actually happening. But I'm glad we got that out of the way, because on your website, you often quote stories of terrorists being arrested and then you quote Quranic verses. You never say on your website that, oh, these guys were arrested because they viewed themselves as defending themselves. You quote verses from the Quran and then say, see, so much for Islam being a religion of peace. You see, that's why they got arrested, because Surah 9, 29 told them to do that. But as I proved in my opening, they're not doing that because they just read the Quran and say, let's just go blow things up. They're doing it because of foreign policy issues. And by the way, that's not me saying it. I quoted you all the sources. Michael Scheuer, go look him up. The intelligence agencies just put in 16 intelligence agencies, Iraq. And that uh, report from the New York Times will come up. The Stanford and uh, Arizona University, New York University, I've quoted you the academics. So that's not really what I'm saying. That's what the experts and the intelligent officers are saying. Now the issue of uh, issues to women, David brought up the issues that uh, concern him, that Islam uh, is a threat because of those verses. But now again, that's the difference which I said. If you want to talk about honor killings and gender equalities, then most Muslims will fully support you. But the difference between me and you is that you simply just want to blame Islam for all those issues when many times those same issues you find in non-Muslim countries, you know, domestic abuse. You talk about wife beating, but there's so much domestic abuse happening in the West. And so, once again, there's a difference of how we view things. Unlike you, I don't view things as simply black and white, that, oh, there's all these problems for Muslim women because of Islam. You know, that's the core reason. A lot of those issues that Muslim women struggle with is because of cultural issues, like honor killings. Honor killings, anybody who does a serious and honest study of honor killings will see that honor killings are purely a uh, backward cultural thing rather than a religious issue. For instance, in Afghanistan, if uh, recently a girl was killed by a man who wanted to marry her, but the father rejected him, so they killed her. How are you going to blame a religion for that? That has nothing to do with religion but has to do with backward culturalistic uh, tribal mentality, not to do with the issue of religion. And as for the issue of Aisha, now let's explain that. That's a very simple issue to answer. First of all, I'd, I'd like to ask, um, what's the age of marriage in the Bible? Because there is none. Nowhere in the Bible does it say you have to be 12, 16, or 18. So what is the standard? According to the standard of both faiths, Christianity and Islam and Judaism, the way you, the right age for marriage is when she is fit, both mentally and physically. That's the criteria 
of marriage. And back in the day, young girls, we, we view them as young girls now, but back in the day, marriage to young girls was very normal. We might view it differently because society has changed, but back then, not just in the Middle East, but virtually in many places in the world, including the United Kingdom, including Europe, marriage to young girls, they wouldn't even be called girls, was very normal. Secondly, even if you read the Hadith, the Hadith only says Aisha moved in with him. Uh, there's nothing about uh, sexual intercourse or what have you. But nonetheless, even if there is those issues, back then that's the way society was. We might view it differently, but back then a 15-year-old boy would be viewed as a man ready to go into war. These days 15-year-olds are not viewed that way. They're more busy playing uh, PS3 or what have you. Society has changed. And anybody who does a simple academic study will see that for themselves. Now obviously, in today's age, it would be wrong to marry a nine-year-old. Why? Because in today's society, we know nine-year-olds are not fit for marriage, especially mentally. They're not ready for marriage. So any Muslim who's indulging in child marriages are wrong. That's not following the Prophet's example because the Prophet's example was marrying a girl or a lady when she was both physically and mentally fit. If you don't do that, you're not following the Prophet's example. And secondly, many Muslim scholars have even come out saying it's wrong for child marriages to happen today. Islamic scholars, why would they say that? They know the Hadiths, they know the Prophet's lives, and these are orthodox Islamic scholars. They're not trying to appease anybody. They're saying that in the Muslim world, where Muslims are in control according to Wood. So why would they come out and say that in the Muslim world, not in the West? So that shows that um, child marriages has no basis in today's society. And what about the issue of tolerance? David keeps bringing up the issue when Muslims are in power, we see something happen. Everybody else is uh, subjugated and uh, they're treated really badly. I'm sorry, history says otherwise. Anybody who studies anything about history in academia will see that non-Muslims who lived under the Islamic State lived in very good conditions. Yes, there were some bad periods, but tell me any society that didn't have bad periods in its society to a minority. We can, we can have that game all day long in the secular West and the Christian West. You know, we live in a secular West. Do you know why we live in a secular age now? Because before secularism, the church used to rule Europe. And they were so oppressive, they didn't allow any freedom for even other Christians. It got so bad that European Christians had to come out and say, you know what, we got to get rid of the church. That's why secularism exists. So when Christians talk about freedom of speech, that's not because of Christianity. That's not because of a church, that's because of secularism. And now David can say, well, I agree, Sammy, the church was wrong. Well, I don't have a problem if he says that. But notice how inconsistent. When the church is bad, <coughs> David will say, yeah, because they weren't good Christians. But then he'll point the finger at Muslims when an Islamic state or a Muslim country is bad. Oh, look at them. You see, that's because of Islam. But when Christianity had so many centuries of backwardness because of the church, oh, that just doesn't have anything to do with Christianity. I mean, you, you just have to be completely biased not to see the inconsistency in that argument. It just doesn't make any sense. But nonetheless, as I said, if anyone studies the history of Islam, the Islamic State, non-Muslims thrived under the Islamic State. There are many examples of that. For example, in Al-Andalus, the Jews were thriving under the Islamic State. They even had their own golden age back then. And what happened? The Christians came back, kicked the Muslims out, and then what did they do to the, what did they do to the Jews? They slaughtered them all. But again, that has nothing to do with Christianity. But if it's Muslims, well, look, they just hate the Jews. Th that's just uh, very inconsistent. And to the issue of gender equality. David Wood uh, named like uh, 12 countries, uh, Mali, Yemen. I mean, Yemen doesn't even have a proper working central government. How are you going to blame Islam for that? Anybody who studies anything about politics, and thankfully I have, Middle East politics, 
Anybody who studies that knows that a country with a weak central government, a country with a corrupt government, is going to have corrupt institutions. Not because of the religion, but because of corrupt politicians. I mean, he names Afghanistan. Are you kidding me? Afghanistan doesn't even have a proper... The, wor the central government of Afghanistan, Karzai's brother, is dealing in the drug trade. So, I mean, like, don't quote these governments. I mean, Pakistan, Libya, Libya, they don't even have a government at the moment, at least not a proper working government. And the irony, Libya, before we overthrew Gaddafi, we were more than happy to send dissidents to Gaddafi to torture. So, where's the consist consistency? Don't blame Islam for that. You see, I'd agree with Wood. There are problems in Muslim countries with gender inequality, and we need to fix that. But when you put the blame on the wrong issue, you're not going to fix the problem, because the problem is in Islam. Take Islam out of the Middle East, you still have those same corrupt institutions. And a large part of the corruption you see in the Middle East, which is changing, has largely been down to corrupt secular parties, not Islamic parties. I mean, Egypt before was secular, Gaddafi was secular, and so forth. So Islam doesn't get the blame. So that's all I'm saying, and my time is up. All right, thank you, uh, Sammy. Um, uh, I'll go ahead and jump right in. Uh, Sammy says that my views of the Muslim scriptures are subjective. Well, no, not at all, because the Quran claims over and over again to be clear. Claims it like a beating drum over and over again. Uh, the Quran is clear. It's fully explained. It's fully, uh, it's explained in detail. This is what the Quran says about itself. So when the Quran says, fight those who do not believe in Allah, notice I say, well, when it says fight those who believe not in Allah, it must mean fight those who believe not in Allah. And if that's what it means, then obviously that would pose a threat to society. And Sammy says, well, that's just your interpretation. That's what the verse actually says. So if it means something else, please explain what it means. He says, I agreed with him that Muslims are simply uh, defending themselves. Actually, what I, agreed with, what I agreed with is that Muslims view themselves in this defensive stage. Um, and that there are implications, there are Islamic implications of these defensive uh, strikes and that according to Islam, as I explained, in Islam, if someone is making mischief in a Muslim land, the penalty is death. And according to, not according to me, according to Muhammad himself, the person who supports that mischief making, even if it's a taxpayer, uh, is also guilty. And that this is why we see various terrorist attacks. I simply said that groups like Al-Qaeda view themselves as obeying these passages. Uh, Sammy said that um, Muslims are fighting because of foreign policy issues. Again, I think it's important. What foreign policy issues do Muslims <coughs> face that no one else faces? Because uh, we see Muslim groups, not obviously not all Muslims, uh, but we see Muslim groups like Al-Qaeda responding in a very different way. Um, he says that non-Muslims who lived in I Islamic states had, it, had things pretty good. I would invite Sammy to read some of the early sources. According to Islam, you have to make the unbeliever feel subdued. Read the Pact of Umar. Read the Pact of Umar and tell me that the Christians who had to agree to that, who had to agree that they weren't going to uh, speak too loudly, that they weren't going to rep repair the, the roofs of their churches if, they're, if, they're, uh, if the roofs caved in, that they couldn't wear crosses, uh, that if, if they were sitting down and a Muslim entered the room, they had to get up and give the Muslim their seat. Ask them if, what kind of treatment this was. Um, so, uh, again, it's the early Muslim sources. Now, if, if let's suppose there's a, a Muslim area where everyone is treated equally, that would be great. That would be wonderful. The point is, that would not be what Islam commands. The best of people, Surah 3, verse 110, Muslims. The worst of creatures, 98.6, Jews and Christians. Sammy says that uh, I'm inconsistent because when the church is bad, I don't condemn Christianity. Um, but when, uh, when, when, is, when Muslims do something bad, I condemn Islam. I've already explained this. I don't know how I can make it any more clear. If, a, if the church, let's say the Christian church, goes on an absolute killing spree, what does Christianity teach? Love your neighbor as yourself, love your enemies, and pray for those who persecute you. That's what Christianity teaches. Of course, I'm just going to go around killing everyone who disagrees with me. You're not following Christianity. And so when I brought up any of these issues involving Islam, it was, here's what Islam teaches. I showed what Islam teaches first, and then I showed the... Uh, the outcome of what Islam teaches. Um, 
On the issue of wife beating, Sammy says, well, there's lots of uh, domestic abuse in the West. Why do I blame Islam for domestic abuse? Uh, couldn't it be cultural? Absolutely, there can be cultural domestic abuse. And you can have domestic abuse uh, in America, in the United Kingdom. You can have it anywhere. The difference is most groups don't have a scripture from God justifying it. So that most groups, when they see someone beating a woman, say, hey, you need to, you need to stop that sort of thing. If you tell a Muslim, and I don't mean, them, I don't, I don't, I don't mean Muslims in general, I don't think most Muslims uh, in the UK uh, do this, but I'm talking about according to Islam. If you tell a man, how dare you, how dare you beat your wife, you're wrong, what's the response? What are you talking about? What are you talking about? Surah 434 says, I can, and Muhammad himself said, a man will not be asked as to why he beat his wife. So you have no basis, you have no basis for condemning the wife beating uh, in an Islamic context. Um, Sammy said that honor killings are the product of a backwards culture. And uh, I, I, certainly, I certainly agree here, and I do want to agree that uh, you don't have to be a Muslim in order to engage in an honor killing. There have been Christians who have uh, killed people in, in honor killings. In other words, some idea of restoring family honor, and you have to kill the, 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 the guilty person. And uh, it, it happens in India. Uh, but uh, statistics show over 90% of honor killings worldwide are committed by Muslims. When you start getting to over 90%, you have to start asking yourself, is this coincidence? Is this coincidence? And I'll be the first one to admit, you don't have clear commands uh, from Muhammad, as you have, let's say, pray five times a day. You don't have go out and kill uh, your daughters if they, get, uh, if they become rebellious or something like that. Uh, but we have to ask why this, pra this practice thrives more in Islam than it does in other contexts. Sammy would say it could be cultural, Possible that it's cultural, but I look at Islam and, and I quoted a passage, Surah 5, verse 33. What did that passage say? The penalty for making mischief in a Muslim land. Some people look at themselves as, hey, if, this, if, if my daughter here is setting a bad example for society, I have to do something about this. It's a smaller form of making mischief in a Muslim land. Very vague crime. Uh, as for Aisha, uh, he says, what's the age of marriage uh, in the Bible? Well, I wasn't appealing to uh, any uh, age of marriage in the Bible. The biblical position would be you don't harm, you don't do something that you, you know is going to harm someone. And uh, we know that marrying nine-year-old girls can be very harmful to them. Um, that's, that's, that's a fact. If you'd like to go through uh, some of the scientific or medical claims, that I'd be fine. Uh, he said the right age for marriage is when girls are fit. Well, uh, uh, nine-year-old girls are not fit. Nine-year-old girls are not fit for sex or marriage. Sammy said back then, cultures were different. Well, think about this. Think about this. According to the Quran, Surah 33, 21, Muhammad's the example for all mankind. That's why lots of Muslims will try to, to dress like him or go to the bathroom like him. Muhammad is the example for, for all mankind. And so if anyone is going to sort of rise above just the, the common culture, well, why wouldn't he? And the pattern laid down by Muhammad is, if you want to marry a nine-year-old girl, that's up to you. Uh, Sammy said the passages I quoted said nothing about sexual intercourse. Actually, they all did. Every last one of them did. Um, and those of you watching on YouTube, be sure to go back and uh, listen to those. All of them said that he consummated the marriage or that he had sex with Aisha when she was nine years old. Uh, Sammy says that Aisha was fit and that girls matured faster back then. According to the passages, Aisha was still playing with dolls, and she was playing on a swing when, when her, her family came to get her to, to take her to, uh, to the consummation of marriage. She sounds like a normal little girl. Um, Sammy says that uh, marrying too young is uh, against Islam, uh, not according to Surah 65, verse 4. Uh, it isn't, and we can certainly talk about that passage. Surah 65, verse 4 allows uh, sex with prepubescent girls. Sammy says, uh, on the list of women's issues, I named a bunch of backwards countries. Uh, well, I'd say Iran, United Arab Emirates, and, and some of these places certainly have a, at least some stable government. Why would, we say, uh, why would we say that 11 of the top 12 worst places to be a woman are Muslim countries? I don't know. All right, uh, lots of issues now. David brought up a good point. He said, all right, he's quoting the Quran which is clear, you know, Surah 929 clearly says, fight the unbelievers, and so that's why you have, or you can look to that, and that's why you'd have a bad thing. Unlike in Christianity, let's say the church went around uh, killing a bunch of people, 
that would be against the Bible because uh, the Bible teaches, you know, love your enemy and uh, what have you. While in Islam, it does teach those bad things and that's why you can see such issues. Again, that's so subjective. That's like trying to have your cake and eat it. So yeah, basically, yeah. So Surah 929 says, fight the unbelievers. So that's why they're doing that, or some of them. But when the church does those things, the Bible never says go out and fight. And well, actually it does. But in your interpretation, it doesn't. For instance, uh, Justin War, Justin Martyr, early Christian fathers talked about the just war. And they used verses from the Bible. David even did something very interesting about honor killings. David mentioned how a Muslim could theoretically justify an honor killing by using a verse in the Quran, uh, punish those who make mischief in the land. So a Muslim will use that verse to justify honor killing, though I don't think they do. But nonetheless, so a Muslim can read the Quran how he wants to, and he can arrive at that conclusion. Guess what? Church fathers did the same thing with the Bible to justify killing and war. Now, if David has a problem with that, he can have a problem with that because he tried to theorize why a Muslim would commit an honor killing by looking at the Quran and coming up with his own interpretation. Well, church fathers did that. If that's good enough for a Muslim who does honor killings, David, it should equally be good enough for church fathers who did the same thing and the same reasoning to justify war according to Christianity. So that point remains. Now, obviously, I'll, I'll even grant it to you. The Bible doesn't say what the church should have done. But if I want to argue like you and look at things black and white, I'll just say, well, you know what? There's a verse in the Bible that's talking about killing people. And then there's another verse in the Bible saying that that's a good teaching, which you can use. Well, I can put two and two together and say, you know what? The church was actually following that teaching. You know, it's very clear. Now, as for 929, let's just address it to give you an example of what I mean, how we just view things differently. So, Surah 929, Wood quotes this verse saying, fight the unbelievers, it's in the Quran. My contention is that it's not that simple. To quote a verse, you need to study its context, its historical context, its context as a book, and so forth. Anybody who studies the context of this verse We'll see, when was it revealed? It was revealed during a stage when the Byzantines were killing messengers of the Muslims and ambassadors. So the Muslim would send an ambassador to Syria, modern day Syria, and they'd kill that guy. That is a declaration of war in modern society. And that was part of the context in which that verse was revealed. So it's not simply so black and white where it says, fight the unbelievers, just like that. And even if you read the hadiths, there are conditions when you're supposed to fight. For example, Wood quoted the hadith where the prophet said, I'm commanded to fight people until they convert. That's the point I'm trying to bring at. That's how he sees things when he simply isolates it. But in context, that verse was revealed when? It was revealed during a stage of war with the pagans. One of the greatest Islamic classical scholars, Imam Nawawi, even said that that hadith was referring to the Arab pagans during the war. So it's not simply so black and white as David is saying. Well, oh, there's this verse in the Quran, and it says, fight the unbelievers. Yeah, that verse is clear, but you need to look at it in context. When you separate something from context, you are not doing any favors to the text. And what about the issue of Muslim terrorists? Now, David is trying to say that according to Muslim terrorists, they view themselves in a defensive crisis, as if to say that they're not really under attack. That's false, because the intelligence officers I quoted you, they weren't saying, oh, Muslims simply think they're under attack. They themselves came out and said, drone strikes cause enemies. There's a big difference. So I'm not simply standing up here telling you what Muslim extremists only think. I also gave you the studies of what the experts say. And according to the experts, civilian casualties causes enemies. So that's why they view themselves in a defensive war, because of what happened. Not simply because they just 
brainwash themselves into thinking that they're in a defensive situation. What about the Pact of Omar? I love the Pact of Omar. It's always brought up. First of all, uh, non-Muslim historians argue that this pact is most likely not authentic. And we can actually prove that this uh, pact wasn't authentic, or if it was authentic, nobody paid attention to it. For example, according to the Pact of Omar, um, you can't repair churches. Well, if you couldn't repair churches, why are there churches still standing? Some old historical churches from that time. If you couldn't repair a church, then they would have all been uh, destroyed and what have you. Secondly, the Pact of Omar contradicts a whole load of other texts we have of Christians who are free to worship. They don't have to get up for a Muslim. Uh, they have their own churches. They have a right to repair their churches. So the Pact of Omar stands against all of that. And even if the Pact of Omar is authentic, what did I say? There's always going to be a period in history when things aren't going to be so good and when a minority won't be treated that well. That's always going to happen. You're never going to have perfect harmony in a society. And so that's all the Pact of Omar would do. But you see how uh, black and white that argument is. Oh, the Pact of Omar, look how it humiliated Christians and whoever. So therefore, you see, this, there's a problem in Islam. Again, I can use that same example. There were worse cases under the church. So are we going to now say, well, the church is also responsible? That would be too black and white. Now, what about the issue of Aisha? Um, the prophet had sex with her. Well, if you actually read it again in the Arabic, it just says it, he went into the house or into. It doesn't say sexual intercourse, and there is a debate and argument with that. And I can refer David to a scholar who knows the Arabic, and I personally know the person, and they could discuss that further. Now, what do we mean when we say the prophet is an example to all of mankind and for all times? Yes, he's an example, but the form can change sometimes. So just because the prophet drove a camel doesn't mean you have to drive a camel. But what does it mean? It means you can uh, have some modes of transportation. The main point remains that when the Prophet got married, he married a girl or lady who was fit for marriage. That's the example we take. So we marry a lady who's fit for marriage, not to do with the age. And my time's up. Uh, all right, well, uh, I'd like to thank everyone for uh, being so calm. I know that it can be uh, difficult if uh, someone is uh, criticizing someone like Muhammad. It would be difficult if someone were criticizing uh, the teachings uh, of Jesus, so uh, I'm glad everyone um, uh, everyone is, is, is happy to take part in, uh, in this kind of debate. Um, I argue that Islam poses a threat to society in terms of uh, its attitude towards non-believers, in terms of its command to violently subjugate non-Muslims, and in terms of uh, killing apostates. Uh, Sammy's position has uh, simply been, well, there, are, there can be other interpretations of that. And that's just your interpretation. Well, I want to point out it's not just my interpretation here. When I talk about Islam commanding uh, Muslims to, if they have the opportunity, subjugate non-Muslims, that's not my interpretation. That's the, that's the interpretation of Muhammad's companions. That's the interpretation of some of the greatest scholars of all time. For instance, I invite you to read Ibn Kathir's commentary on that. Uh, and, and, uh, well, we don't have time, but uh, Ibn Kathir's commentary, you can read it, it's available online. He says that the uh, Muslims are supposed to fight the Christians and the Jews because of our beliefs. Uh, some of the other issues. Uh, Sammy seems to, to keep saying, well, uh, yes, it, David, if you wouldn't condemn a Christian. Uh, you wouldn't condemn a Christian. You wouldn't condemn uh, a Jew for doing these sorts of things, but yet you condemn Muslims. Well, my, my approach has been the same, the exact same since I started. Lay out the Muslim teachings and then the results of those teachings. Uh, Sammy says that uh, anyone who knows the context of 929 says that it was uh, during a time when Byzantines were killing the messengers. Read the commentary of Ibn Kathir. The, 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 the historical background was Muhammad said the pagans are no longer allowed to take the pilgrimage to Mecca, and the Quraysh said, how are we going to make money now? And Muhammad said, 929, fight those who believe not in Allah until they pay you the jizya. Uh, Sammy says that the Pact of Umar wasn't authentic. Uh, I would just uh, close out 
with, if we're saying that, uh, I mean, first of all, someone like Ibn Kathir certainly thought it was, and the dispute is usually over whether it was Caliph Umar or some other Umar, uh, but if we're saying that life is a picnic under, uh, under Islam, uh, let me read uh, one of Bukhari's works in 1103. Abu Huraira reported that the Prophet, may Allah bless him and grant him peace, said, do not give the people of the book the greeting first, force them to the narrowest part of the road. And in response to this, Ibn Umar, one of Muhammad's companions, uh, we read that um, a Christian greeted Ibn Umar, I Ibn Umar returned the greeting, and when he learned that the man was a Christian, he went back to him and said, give me back my greeting. There is this attitude of forcing Christians to the, to the, narrow, uh, to the narrow part of the road, uh, of, of making them feel themselves subdued. This is obviously a threat to society. Sammy says it's got nothing to do with Islam. I say your prophet and your sources say something completely different. Uh, we'll try to do Q and A if there's any time, but because we had it planned for Q and A, so it's not nothing to do with me and Wood. But nonetheless, as for uh, tonight's debate, now tonight's debate comes down to the main issue. It's David Wood quotes all those all of these verses and hadiths, and I'm not rejecting them. I'm not saying um, they don't exist. What I'm saying is that his reading and interpretation of those hadiths or Quran is his own subjective view. That's my argument. And I brought up the, uh, the terrorists, the extremists, even show that those people fighting don't view things as he does. And that we can do the same thing with the Bible, or not with the Bible, with the church. The point is, the church used to be very bad. So if I want to use David's uh, type of argument, I'll just say, well, there's a verse in the Bible and that's why they were bad, because they saw it like that. Now, David will say, well, that's, that, they were wrong. The, the Bible doesn't say anything like that. The Bible doesn't say kill people. That's the point I'm trying to make with the Quran. When David quotes a verse saying, fight the unbelievers, or uh, treat everybody badly, my argument is that the Quran does not make those arguments. And an example is Surah 929. David quotes Ibn Kathir. Ibn Kathir is just one scholar. You know, just because one uh, Islamic scholar said something does not make it an issue of unanimity or unanimous. So that's not really uh, a major argument of what uh, Ibn Kathir said that, so that must be that. And even the issue of uh, uh, not greeting somebody first. Let me give you an, another example of how that interpretation or how David is explaining that is so black and white. Back then, when certain people used to greet the Muslims, specifically the Prophet, they would say, death be upon you, in Arabic. they twist the words. So it was in that context that the Prophet used to say, don't greet them first, because they used to come and greet the Muslims and a Prophet in a very negative manner. But there are also plenty of other hadiths that do talk about greeting people in general, which say, if somebody greets you, greet them with a better greeting. It doesn't say if they're a Muslim. It's talking about everybody. So again, the point I'm trying to make is we have to look at these things in context. And even the issue of supposedly force a non-Muslim down the narrow side of the road. Muslim scholars didn't view it like that. Back in the Islamic State, when a Muslim used to pass by a Christian or a Jew, they weren't pushing them to the side. Nobody saw it like that. So again, it's not simply so black and white. So all I'd say is that we need to just be consistent and not look at everything in a black and white manner because we can do it with both the Bible and the Quran. Thank you.